good. All right, so this is Math 314, Algebra 1, which is uh, the first of what is sometimes a two-semester sequence in algebra. So, um, but this is the basic algebra class that everyone who majors in math certainly has to take, and people in other subjects, um, computer science, physics, sometimes the education method <clears throat> are encouraged to take. And um, we deal with uh, the fundamental thing, which are going to be groups, uh, and what is called group theory. So lectures um, will uh, all be on Zoom. They will be recorded and posted um, uh, the same day later, uh, today always, uh, on YouTube. So you can see a lecture or parts of a lecture again or uh, watch the lecture if you had to miss it. Uh, but I will try always to remember to record each lecture and post it on YouTube. Um, exams will all be in person on campus um, in Gillette Hall. Um, but the exams are probably just a midterm exam uh, in March and the final exam at the end of May. Um, there will also be every week <clears throat> several, uh, which you might think of as online office hours, really, they're more like problem sessions or question and answer sessions where you can log on <clears throat> and ask me to do problems or explain something you had a question about. Um, and there will usually be at least two or three uh, problem sessions a week. And I <clears throat> make them at different times because uh, some people work during the day and it's convenient to have a session in the evening or some people would like a session in the afternoon rather than the morning or the morning rather than the afternoon. So usually every week I will post on Blackboard the um, uh, schedule of problem sessions for the week. Uh, but if you have a question and you can't make any of the problem sessions, send me an email and we can arrange a time when uh, uh, that's convenient for you, basically. So I'm available quite a bit. Um, just send me an email if you can't make a schedule a problem session and we will uh, set up a time. Uh, there will be homework due every week. Uh, you write out the solutions. Uh, convert your pages to a PDF file and <clears throat> and you upload the PDF file to um, the appropriate assignments homework section in uh, on Blackboard. So if you go to Blackboard under assignments, all the assignments will be listed. Each will have its own particular uh, place and um, you upload the, the, the assignment there. Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes people ask, how do you convert uh, a handwritten page to a PDF? Uh, the simplest way, if you have a printer, almost every printer now has an option where instead of actually printing, it converts to a PDF file. So um, you just uh, put your pages on your printer and convert to a PDF file. Uh, if anyone has uh, difficulty doing that, again, just contact me during a problem session. And we can try and work uh, work things out. Um, you should have um, you should go to Blackboard frequently. So, for example, um, let's see if I can find it here. Um, Let's see, algebra. Let me see what I can do with this. Um, so someone asked about my lab. 
Um, but this is algebra. It's not calculus. So why did you ask about my lab? Uh, we don't use my lab in this course. Uh, uh, no, Professor, I saw it on uh, whiteboard. Uh, sorry, blackboard. Uh, uh, it says uh, this part of this course is part of uh, my lab also. I was reading it. I found one of the notes in it. Oh, let me just double check because <clears throat> okay. uh, I'm teaching a calculus section that uses my lab, and I wrote up information sheets for both. So let me just make sure that uh, I didn't include something that I should not have. Um, So I'm trying to find some, oh, here we are. So this is the lecture schedule on Blackboard <laughs> for this class. Um, so the book, the textbook is uh, Algebra, Abstract and Concrete. And uh, fortunately, it is free. Um, so you can download a copy from the internet, but you don't have to because <clears throat> I downloaded it and posted it on Blackboard. So the entire book is there and you don't have to buy a text. And for at least the first half of the semester, <clears throat> up until the midterm, I've listed exactly the sections that I'm going to cover in each class. This is lecture one, this is today, and so forth. So you can see exactly what is going to be covered. And it's strongly uh, encouraged that you look at the material before the lecture because it makes things a lot easier to understand. But let me look for the information sheet. Um, Algebra information. So this is the information sheet I posted for Math 314. And On this sheet, under homework and um, an exam. Oh, all right. So, yeah, that's a mistake. That was that should have just have been on the. Uh, let's try this. Okay, <laughs> this is corrected, I hope. Homework assignments are posted on Blackboard. Sorry, that even that's not true. Um, so homework assignments are, um, yeah, uh, it's posted on Blackboard. Uh, all assignments must be completed. Um, and um, the PDF, must be uploaded to the assignment section of Blackboard.
Let's try this. There is a homework assignment every week. Uh, homework assignments are posted on Blackboard and for the first half of the semester, all the homeworks are already uh, listed there. All assignments must be completed and the PDFs of the homework uh, must be uploaded to the assignments uh, section of Blackboard. So I will correct that on the website, but that is the correct statement. Thank you. Okay. Um, students are having trouble getting into Zoom. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Don't know what to do about that. Obviously, um, it's possible to get into Zoom because 10 of you have managed to do so, so already. Um, so uh, if someone is in contact with someone who can't get into Zoom right now, um, you can tell them but that first they should email me and let me know. Um, and second, you should let them know that this lecture will be uploaded to uh, YouTube and they can watch it uh, later today. Okay. All right. Um, what else can I say? Well, um, let's take a look at something. Um, This is the book. It's called Algebra, Abstract and Concrete. And the author um, was kind enough to decide he would make it freely available to the world uh, at no cost. And um, here it is. And there's a nice picture on the front. and. You might wonder what in the world that is, and uh, maybe in the course of this semester, we'll learn. Um, in the table of contents, the goal is to cover the first three chapters of the book. So today I'm going to talk about symmetry, and then for the next two weeks, we'll be looking at permutations and properties of the integers, polynomials. Um, and then we will get into group theory proper. And the main part of the course is to understand what is a group in mathematics. It's an absolutely fundamental thing which comes up everywhere in math and science. In some sense, when you study physics, once you get beyond the elementary stuff, and you are studying uh, uh, things that are very closely related to symmetry in groups. And uh, so this first page of the table of contents is basically what uh, I hope to cover this semester. And if you take a second semester of calculus, uh, you will learn more about what are called rings and fields. Um, if you read a little bit beyond this syllabus into chapter four, symmetry of polyhedra, then you will begin to understand the picture that is on the cover of the book. Okay. But for us, we start right here. And we're going to talk about symmetry. Right. But maybe before I start, let me uh, ask again whether there are um, any questions about the mechanics of the course. Um, the lectures twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays, but I have a lecture schedule and you'll notice some days are, some days, Mondays, we don't have school. Uh, sometimes a Tuesday is declared to be a Monday, but the detailed schedule of when we meet is on the lecture schedule. There's weekly homework. Um, you upload the homework um, 
to Blackboard. Uh, it's graded, um, uh, but it's graded only in the sense that uh, I wanna make sure you're doing the homework and making a decent stab at trying to do uh, most of the problems. Um, sometimes there are only a couple of problems and you really should try to do them all. Uh, but I'm not going to correct homework problems individually. Um, I, I will go over homework problems in the problem sessions uh, or even in these lectures, uh, if you ask. Uh, there's a midterm in March. There's a final the end of May. Um, that's the whole story. Okay. All right, so maybe since we have this book online uh, and I can actually put it up on the screen as I just did, um, I can talk about the text and not have to write everything out. So we're going to be talking in the beginning about symmetry. And um, here's a rug. And this shows a certain kind of symmetry. What is the symmetry? Well, let's see. If you were to draw a vertical line through the center of the rug, you see that this is symmetric in the sense that the pattern on the right is exactly replicated on the left. So if you were to somehow reflect this rug through this vertical, axis, you would get back the same rug. You wouldn't see any difference. Um, of course, this is done by human knitting. So there will be tiny variations, but roughly the pattern is the same. And you might say that this vertical line through the center is an axis of symmetry uh, so through reflection. In fact, <laughs> if you want to see something symmetric, look in a mirror because your face is symmetric. Uh, if you were to draw a straight line uh, from your forehead to your neck through your nose, the right side and the left sides of your face are basically the same. So the human face has an axis of symmetry, a vertical axis of symmetry, in the sense that if you reflect through that axis, you don't see any difference. Um, now, a reflection is one possible kind of symmetry. Um, but a simpler form of symmetry occurs uh, not by doing a reflection, by <coughs> but by a physical movement of an object. So here's a nice example. Here you take, well, take a three by five card or take any rectangular object. Um, so can everyone see this? I want to make sure that this is clear. Uh, someone say yes if you can see this blue rectangle in this on the screen. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. So this is just uh this is a rectangle. I mean it looks like a parallelogram because you're looking at it or it's drawn at an angle, but this is a rectangle. And through the center of the rectangle, parallel to the long sides, you see this line. And if this were a piece of cardboard and you literally rotate it high radians or 180 degrees around, you would still have the same rectangle. Uh, it would occupy the same space. And if someone were looking at this rectangle, close their eyes, and then you did or did not rotate it by 180 degrees and the person opened his eyes, wouldn't see any difference, right? Wouldn't know whether you had turned it or not. So this is an example of a kind of rotational symmetry. Um, so one, it's very hard to define symmetry. Uh, in fact, there is a long literature uh, in mathematics and philosophy, not philosophy, but let's say in art theory about how to define a symmetry. But one notion, one definition is given right here that a symmetry is an undetectable motion. That is, if you look at this card, close your eyes, someone may or may not flip it around and you open your eyes, you can't tell, right? It's an undetectable motion. And an object is called symmetric if it has symmetries. Um, 
Now the footnote is important. Um, a related notion of symmetry involves reflections of the car. So just like if you look at a mirror, um, if you reflect your the image of your face through this vertical line through your nose, you get back the same image, but that's a reflection. That's not a motion. Um, uh, and at the beginning, we're going to talk about motions. And a little bit later, we will include reflections. And um, this is the first part of the first homework for next Monday. Take a rectangular card. I mean, literally, take a rectangular card. I mean, a piece of paper is a rectangular card. Um, find all the symmetries of it. What can you do with a card? Let's see. Um, let me uh, try something for a moment. Here we are. Let's see if we can see this. Um, maybe I'll do it differently. Um, okay. Here is a card literally a three by five card. What are the, some of the things you can do to this card that keeps it looking exactly the same? Well, you could, rotate it through an axis through the center, like this. And it's the same card. You can't tell whether or not I rotated it if you didn't see the physical motion. Or you can rotate it through a line through the center parallel to the short sides. There we are. That's another symmetry. What's another symmetry? I could take this corner and put it, I could take the upper right-hand corner and put it where the lower left-hand corner was. Right? That's a third symmetry. What's another symmetry? Okay, well, close your eyes for a second. Whoop. Okay. Looks the same. What did I do? Well, you can't tell. In fact, in this case, what I did was nothing. So I didn't move the card at all. But that's also a kind of symmetry. You might say it's fairly trivial. It's what is called often the uh, identity symmetry. It's like the motion is, don't move it. So we've already seen now four symmetries of a rectangle. There's the identity, stays the same. There's the rotation through the long axis. That's one symmetry. There's the rotation through the short axis. There's another symmetry. And there's the diagonal rotation, which sends the upper right to the lower left and the lower left to the upper right. Okay. There it is. So there are at least four symmetries of a rectangle. And That, in fact, is part of the first homework problem. Exercise 1.1, catalog all the symmetries of a non-square rectangular card. Get a card and look at it. That's what I just did. Turn it about. Move its parts as you need. Um, that is, you could do the following. Let me... Um, draw a picture of this. So stop share, okay. So here is the card. Let me draw the place where it's going to be put. And let's say I label the vertices A, B, C, D and on the paper, and then they actually label the vertices on the card A, B, 
C, D. So what are some th symmetries of the card? Well, first of all, I can do nothing. So A, B, C, D stay exactly where they are. What happens if I put the upper right-hand corner where the lower left-hand corner was? There we are. So it's filling the same space. But if you want to understand what, how, you, how it actually moved, you see what used to be A, what is A on the card, is now in the C position. What is the C on the card is now in the A position. What is, maybe I should, um, it's hard for me to read upside down, especially because my B and my D look the same. So let me call this, let me write this as B, C, A, D. Um, Oops. So here we are, A, B, C, D. Suppose I rotate it around this axis. Okay. So now A is in the C position, B is in the D position, C is in the A position, and D is in the B position. So I've moved the card, but it still is occupying the same space. And if I hadn't written these letters, uh, the card is just the card. It's just where it always was, right? So it's actually kind of interesting and a little bit fun to um, I'm doing this just because I can't read upside down very well. Um, yeah. So I got this by rotating around this sort of longitudinal axis. And if I rotate it around the center by 180 degrees, huh, I'm back where I started. And if I flip it around the short axis, let's see. I'm not doing this as well as I like, so let me start this again. So here we have A, B, C, D. This is where my A is. If I flip this around this axis, A is here, D is here, B is here, C is here. You can see it's an actual three by five card because it has lines on it. Um, okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So that's, that's what we're doing here. Now, the second problem is to do the same thing for a square. Right. Square is a special case of a rectangle, but a square has um, every side the same length. So you might expect or you might guess that there are more symmetries for a square than there are for a rectangle. And that's true. For example, if you take a rectangle that's not a square and you rotate it 90 degrees, it's not in the same position. But if you take a square and rotate it 90 degrees, it is in the same position. So every symmetry of a rectangle is a symmetry of a square, but there are additional symmetries for a square that do not hold for rectangles. And then the third homework problem is to take a brick that is a rectangular solid, a three-dimensional object, and try to figure out what are the symmetries of a brick. That's an interesting question. Um, you probably don't have a brick at home to experiment with, but you can just take a book, which is a kind of kind of a brick-shaped object. It has length, 
height and thickness, and the three dimensions are different. So a book is a good experimental object to play with. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, so <laughs> we were just looking at symmetries of the rectangle and the square, and we found for the rectangular card, um, four symmetries. We found three actual motions. Um, when they say two rotations of pi or 180 degrees, they mean the axes through parallel to the long, through the center parallel to the long edges and the axis through the center parallel to the short edges. And there's also um, a rotation of pi around a, uh, an, a vertical axis through the center. That's, that's the rotation, that's the symmetry that sends the upper right-hand corner to the lower left-hand corner and the lower left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner. And so those are the three physical symmetries. And then there's the fourth symmetry, which I said we can call the identity or the non-motion. That means you take the card, you don't move it at all. So it's like a rotation of zero degrees, because when you rotate zero degrees, you're not rotating. Uh, so we have four different symmetries. Now, there's an interesting question, because suppose you take your card and you rotate it around an axis by 180 degrees or by pi. Well, suppose you rotate it three and a half times around or three times around. That brings you the card back to the same position exactly. And you can ask whether those should be counted as different rotations or the same rotation. So again, once you get into calculus, we don't measure angles by degrees, we measure angles but only by radians. So if you rotate by pi around the axis, you get exactly the same as if you rotated by minus pi or two pi or three pi and so forth. Um, and what we do now is to consider a rotation of by, let's say, by pi is the same as a rotation by uh, three pi, because you just, every two pi rotation brings you back to where you started, and then the additional pi is the actual rotation. So this is what the author means when he says, which is it? Which of these rotations, are they different or the same? Um, are there four symmetries or infinitely many? Because you can rotate by, two pi radians and nothing happens. Um, our choice is that we only consider the symmetries which actually give a different, a physically different object. So a rotation by pi and a rotation by three pi are exactly the same. Right. Here are symmetries of a square. So um, this rotation through the vertical axis could be a rotation of either pi over two or pi. Uh, those give you different symmetries. Again, the simplest way to understand this and to get a physical feel, feel for it is to actually get a piece of paper or cardboard, cut out a square, cut out a rectangle and play with it. See the actual rotations that give you symmetric motions, okay? Now, we want to be able to do mathematics with the symmetries of a rectangle. And the first thing is to give each of these uh, symmetries a name. So here in this picture, here we have a rectangle. So if we rotate through this line, through the center parallel to the short size, that's this line. If you rotate by pi radians, we call that rotation R1. If you take the axis through the center parallel to the long side and you rotate by pi over two, by pi radians, we call that rotation R2. If you take this vertical axis through the center and you rotate by pi radians, so that switches the corners of the rectangle, we call that R3. And 
the identity where we do, the non-motion we're going to call E. Now, if you think about this for a second, you could say, well, I could take my card, I could perform the rotation R1. That's the rotation through the short axis. And I can follow that by a rotation R2, which is the rotation through the long axis and see what I get. So let me actually try to draw some pictures and see what this is. So let me stop the share for a moment. And you should see this paper and so on this paper, here's my rectangle. And the rotation through this line, parallel to the short sides of the rectangle, that's R1. The rotation through the line parallel to the long side of the rectangle, that's R2. And the rotation around the center by pi degree idians is R3. So let's see what happens. If I take A, B, C, D, and I perform the rotation R1, which is flipping it over vertically, then this becomes BC and this becomes AD, right? That's when I flipped it like that, right? The CB ends up over here and the DA ends up over here. Suppose, I perform the rotation R2, which is the rotation through this axis through the center parallel to the long sides. So the top DC goes to the bottom and the bottom AB goes to the top. Suppose I perform the rotation R3, which is a rotation around the center by pi radians. So C comes around to A. A moves up to where C was. B moves around to D. D moves around to B. So this is the rotation R3. <clears throat> All right. Now, suppose we do this. Suppose we do R1 followed by R2. And we use, this is just the same notation as you use in calculus. If these are, this is like composition of functions. This is, this is like a function applied to the uh, rectangle. So first you apply R1, then you apply R2. So if I take my rectangle, A, B, C, D, and I apply R1 to it, this is this flip around the horizontal axis. So the top goes to the bottom and the bottom goes to the top. And then to this rectangle, I apply the rotation R2. <clears throat> R2 is a flip. I'm sorry, uh, I did this backwards. R1 is flipping the vertical axis. So 
let me do this properly and I should have drawn the line. So this is R1. So when you do that vertical flip, sorry, let's flip this way. The right side BC goes to the left side and the left side AD goes to the right side. Then I apply R2, which is the flip along the, around this horizontal axis. So this sends the bottom BA to the top and the top CD to the bottom. This was wrong. When I did this rotation around the center, A went to C, B went to D, C went to A, and D, where B was. That's right. Now that's correct. So this is the composite, R2, R1. And you look and you see where did the corners A, B, C, D end up? Here's A, here's C, here's B, here's D. That's exactly this picture. So what this shows us is that the rotation R1 followed by, or I like to say multiplied by R2 is the rotation R3. So when you apply one symmetry motion and then a second symmetry motion, you get a third symmetry motion, but there are only four symmetries. So it has to be one of these, the identity R1, R2, and R3. So this says that R2, R1 is equal to R3. Okay. So this is a very interesting idea. And um, yeah. Any questions about this? Uh, this is not the sort of thing you do in calculus, but you're not doing calculus anymore. So let's go back and see what the text says. Uh, share screen to our text. Oh, it says, ah, if you perform first R1, which I just did, and then R2, which I did, the result has to be one of the four symmetries, R1, R2, R3, or E. And the author says that he claims it's R3, and we just showed that. That was kind of nice. Right. So just the way in elementary school, you learn the multiplication tables, uh, you know, two times three is six, five times four is 20 and so forth. When we're dealing with these symmetries, we can also make a multiplication table. So what does that mean? So we have four symmetries. E is the identity or the non-motion, rotation R1, rotation R2, rotation R3. So I make this table with four columns and four rows labeled by the rotations. And what I'm going to fill in is the multiplication table. So R1 times R2, that's R3. And you can fill in this table. This means do the rotation. For example, what would go here? It would be the rotation R2 followed by the rotation R3. R1. Sorry? R1. No, right here in this position. Yeah. Are you saying this? it is R1? Yeah. That may be. Uh, but the, what you would fill into this square is R2 followed by R3. Right. So this would be the multiplication table for symmetries of the rectangle. And I hope, let's just go and see. Um, 
well, I was going to say, I hope it's a homework problem, but it's not because they do it for you. Um, but you can fill in. This is the multiplication table for symmetries of the rectangle. Now, the other object we looked at is a square. A square has eight symmetries. The four symmetries of the rectangle plus there are four more. Hmm. Actually, let's take a look. Let's see if we can figure out ourselves what the symmetries of a square are. Let's say stop the share, fair enough. And here I have. A square, A, B, C, D. So let's see if I can label, if I can find symmetries of the square. So one symmetry is the identity or the non-motion. That means don't do anything. That's a symmetry. Another symmetry would be rotate around this vertical axis. So that switches the right and left sides. So AD moves from the left to the right, and BC moves from the right to the left. I could have ro rotation through this horizontal axis. So the top goes to the bottom and the bottom goes to the top. The bottom AB goes to the top. The top DC goes to the bottom. And then I could also have, when I rotate pi by pi radians around the center, So A goes around to C, B goes to D, C goes to A, and D goes to B. So this would be R1, R2, R3, which are the symmetries of a rectangle and a square is a rectangle. But a square has more symmetries. What are some additional symmetries? Well, you could take A, B, C, D and just rotate it by pi over two radians. So you can send A. Now, Professor, can you move down the paper? Oh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, always if, I'm, if I lose, uh, if the image isn't on the computer screen, always let me know. So if I rotate, by pi over two radians, not by pi, pi over two, A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, D goes to A. So this is another symmetry. And if you look at the configurations of the letters here, you see it's different from all of these. What's one more rotation that we didn't use before? I could rotate by three pi over two radians. So A goes one, two, three over here. B goes around to here. C goes around to here. D goes around to there. That's another rotation. That's another symmetry. Let's see if.
The diagonal. Can you tell me some other symmetries of the square. The diagonal rotation. Um, I mean, the flip, flipping the di through diagonal. Let's see. So suppose I take this diagonal and I flip it. So A and C stay same. Don't change, but B and D switch places. And if I can rotate through one diagonal, I should also be able to rotate through the other diagonal. So in this rotation, A, B, and D don't change, but A and C change places. So A is here and C is here. So it looks like so far, maybe there are more, but uh, so far we have eight. Let's see if I change this so I get them all on the screen. We have eight symmetries of the square. Are there any more? I see someone is asking about Math 156 in chat, but this is not Math 156. This is Math 314. So I'm puzzled why someone is asking about a different class. Um, okay. This puzzle. Uh, I am teaching Math 156 also, but that's a completely different course. Okay, uh, squares. So I have eight symmetries of the square so far. Are there any more? Anyone have a thought about this? Of course, in mathematics, you need more than a thought. Um, you need a proof of what you assert. So That's I claim it. I don't even have to look for other symmetries. I can prove that there are no more symmetries of the square. And how do we give a proof of that? Well, here's something you might think about. So you have your square, A, B, C, D. And when you rotate, the square is occupying the same physical space. So let's look at this lower left-hand corner, which I've labeled by A. Now, how many motions of the square leave A in the same place? Well, there are only two possibilities. You either have A, and then to the right is B. See, what, what, are, what are the points adjacent to A, B and D? So you either have B to the right of A and D above it, the only other possibility is that D is to the right of A and B is above it. That's actually, um, let's see, where do we have that? Uh, yeah, here. So here we have A and D is, so here we have A in the lower left-hand corner. Here we have A in the lower left-hand corner. Here D is to the right and B is above. Here B is to the right and D is above. And those are the only possibilities. There's no way you can rotate, or do anything to the square so that C is next to A, because it's not. The only two corners that are next to A are B and D. So whatever final configuration you end up with, next to A will be B and D. So if A is in the lower left-hand corner, there are only two possible symmetries or motions of the square this and this. But of course, A doesn't have to be in the lower left-hand corner. A can be in any corner. For example, A could be in, when you end up, in the upper left-hand corner. But again, <coughs> next to A <coughs> can only be B and D. 
So if A is here, you either have B below and D to the right, or you have A in the upper left-hand corner, as in here, and D is below and B is to the right. There are only two possibilities. So you can make the following purely mathematical argument. No matter what symmetry you apply to the square, A has to end up, of course, in one of the four corners. It's nowhere else. And when A is in a given corner, there are only two symmetries that have A in that corner because next to A are B and D in one order or the other. So you have four places A could end up. And for each such place, there are two possible symmetries. And four times two is eight. So there are at most eight symmetries of the square, but I've written down on this sheet of paper exactly eight symmetries of the square. So that's all there are. So we just proved that the symmetries of a square are eight in number. They're exactly eight symmetries of the square. So that's a very interesting, purely mathematical argument. Uh, and the kind of argument that we will use uh, more than once in this class. Okay, so let's go back to looking at the text. Oops, what happened to it? Where is... I lost my textbook. Let me find it again. Can you see the textbook on the screen now? Yes. Okay. So, so here is the square. And this is the notation that they're using for the symmetries of the square. So R corresponds to a rotation around this vertical axis. And you can rotate either by zero radians, that's the identity, that means you don't do anything, that's E. Or you can rotate by pi over two, or do it twice, let me call that R. R square means rotate twice, that's pi over two plus pi over two is pi. R cubed means rotate three times, so that's three pi over two. What would R four be? A rotation by four times pi over two, which is two pi, but a rotation of two pi brings everything back to where it was, so that's just the identity. And A, B, C, and D, a is the reflection, is the rotation through this axis. B is the rotation through this axis. And C and D are the two diagonal rotations. So that is the notation that the text is using for the symmetries of a square. And if you want to work out the multiplication table, uh, which you will be asked to do in homework, uh, it's a lot of calculation. Uh, but it's the only way to get a feeling for what's going on. There are eight rotations, so there, the multiplication table will be an eight by eight array. So there's 64 boxes that have to be filled in. But once you get the idea of what's going on, it's really very, very quick. Um, before going on with your reading, stop here and finish working out the multiplication table. Not a bad idea. So, yeah. when uh, what the author of the book is calling breaking symmetry means instead of taking the pure square unmarked, uh, if you want to understand what's going on, you can actually, with your pen or pencil, write down names for the corners, A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four. And so you can actually see the result of physically moving the square, but it still is a symmetry. Um, 
This was the multiplication table for symmetries of the rectangle. That's straightforward. Ah, well, if you want to be lazy, you can look up the multipl multiplication table for symmetries of the square, but you won't really understand anything unless you actually work this out yourself. So the square represent the uh, the same rotations uh, twice. Excuse me. The square, the R squared uh, represent is the uh, is the uh, rotation is done like the same rotation done twice. Right. So no. So R is rotation by pi over two. If you okay. do it twice, pi over two plus pi over two is pi. So R squared means two rotations of pi over two, which is one rotation of pi radians. Okay, good. So the R is pi over two and the R square is pi. Uh, pi. Right, and R cubed is three pi okay. over two. Okay, good. And R four would be two pi. four pi over two or two pi, but that's the same as zero, rota uh, rotation by zero. So that just brings you back to the identity. So if you do, as you do one rotation after another, it's cyclical. It's like you're rotating the square by pi over two radians, and every four rotations brings you back to exactly the same starting point. Yeah. And then another part of the homework for Monday is to do the same thing with an equilateral triangle a triangle where all three sides have the same length, all three angles are the same, uh, pi over three radians or 60 degrees. And they're telling you that there are in fact six different symmetries of the equilateral triangle. And they want you to work it out and work out the multiplication table. Okay. All right. So this is chapter one, sections one, two, and three. Um, that is uh, the topic of the day. Um, linear algebra is not uh, uh, I don't think linear algebra is a prerequisite for this class. If you've taken linear algebra, you know what a matrix is. You've, you've, you're used to working with matrices, but not everyone has. So this section on symmetry and matrices, we're going to skip over. And on Monday, we will begin to study permutations, which is an extremely important operation in algebra, group theory, combinatorics, many other fields. But that's Monday's lecture, so I don't want to start it today. Um, OK. Um, any questions about anything that we've done? Uh, I will uh, post an office hour on Friday uh, morning. Uh, if anyone has uh, a question about the homework uh, uh, that you want to ask before the weekend. Um, Professor? Yes. Um, I just had a question. So the homework would be exercise one, all the questions there, and then 1.3, all the questions there as well, right? Uh, let me just check. Um, So this is the homework schedule. So it says in section 1.1, there are three problems, one, two, and three. 
In section 1.3, there are three problems, one, two, and three. So that is the homework for Monday. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, if there are, aren't any questions, then we can quit early today. First day of semester is always kind of easy, I think. Well, it may not be easy, um, but um, because this is perhaps unfamiliar if you've uh, not taken or thought about this kind of mathematics before. You might even ask, why is this mathematics? Because all I did was draw pictures, but in mathematics, drawing pictures is always a good thing. Um, okay, if there's nothing else, then we're done. And uh, everyone have a pleasant rest of the week and weekend. Uh, for the office hours, uh, do you have to request for the time with you? But through email or like it's open? Sorry? Um, the office hours. When I post, a, a, it's not so much an office hour, it's a problem session. So if I say there's a problem session at 10 o'clock, I'm on, I'm on Zoom at 10 o'clock. Um, if there are a lot of questions and it goes more than an hour, I can usually stay more than an hour. If I'm Zoom on Zoom at 10 o'clock and I'm there and half an hour has gone by and no one's asked, no one's logged on at all, I go off and uh, do some work. So, um, so it's going to be the five, same. But when, but when there's an office, when there's a problem session posted, you don't need to sign up in advance. You just sign up. Uh, you just log in if you want, and it's the same Zoom login for okay. everything. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, y'all. Be well. We're done. Okay, bye. Hey, Professor. I am at 156, map 156. I was wondering if um when the syllabus and stuff is going to be posted. Oh, um, by tonight. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. But the, yes, uh, it's not so much the syllabus that you need. You need to get made. Oh, yeah, coursework. Um, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> but I will be uploading uh, the homeworks uh, for at least the first half of the whole semester tonight, uh, okay, as okay. well as syllabus and office hours and so on. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. Bye bye. Bye all. Bye.